Good, ev good evening, everyone, and welcome to the second webinar of our series. And I'm just doing a bit of multitasking of letting people in. So this evening, we are going to uh, receive a presentation from Karen Harrison from Team Jean. And it's the first time Karen's presented for us. So I'm really looking forward to the new material and the new context that she'll present. Um, Karen, just to introduce her, she has a passion for nutrigenomics and she lectures uh, in that subject at CNM. Her MSc in genetics and nutrition has helped her to support her clients in the area of energy production, repair potential, and sleep and lifestyle choices. And it's very much the energy production aspect that she's going to be presenting tonight. So a couple of minutes ago I asked, um, you know, to send through where you are in the world, what you do, and what you'd like to learn tonight. So if you haven't if you didn't receive that instruction, do that now. And I will pass over to Karen and she can get going with her presentation. So thanks, Karen. Thank you very much, Ian. It's absolutely lovely um, to be here this evening. And thank you very much for your time on this Easter week, basically. So, um, you know, that's absolutely wonderful. So um, yes, I am Karen Harrison. I do run Team Jean. Um, and uh, it's my pleasure to uh, be with you this evening and thank you very much for your time. So uh, these, um, this is just a contents uh, introduction. Um, we're going to be doing talking about energy production, the Krebs cycle um, and the three, three things that are really the first step of energy uh, production is cysteine, glutathione and iron. And there are some key genes behind those. So, um, and obviously there's all of the references that goes on with that as well. I'm not gonna do an in-depth understanding of nutrigenomics. I'd, I'd need to do about a good day and a bit on that one. Um, and I won't be doing a complete review of the Krebs cycle, but there is my infographics um, that are on this presentation. Um, but I will be coming an awful lot of information for you. So uh, let's get going. So um, as Ian said, that there is um, nutrigenomics, uh, there is a chat box. So if you could put in there, do use nutrigenomics testing in your practice, if you are a sports nutritionist or a nutritionist, for instance, um, and does genetic testing concern you? Um, because particularly from an, uh, an athlete point of view, there is, um, a lot of concern about genetic testing. And I, I fully, I fully get that. Um, and I just want to um, perhaps allay your, your fears um, regards to team gene uh, testing anyway, let's put it that way. So we'll just spot on this one, ethical use of genetic testing. I just want to point out that um, what we're going to be going through today um, is not going to give you um, the answers as to whether you're going to be any better than anybody else, whether your twitch muscles are faster than anybody else or anything like that. OK, so um, the, the testing is really to establish if you are really, um, you know, it, none of it is about, you know, whether you've got any major diseases. I'm certainly not going to be able to tell you who you're related to. Um, and, um, you know, the genes that I, I do test for, they are involved in optimizing energy production, repair potential, and sleep and lifestyle choices. So if there are any concerns, you can obviously email me afterwards and, and I give you my details afterwards that one. Um, so um, what is in, uh, nutrigenomics? Well, it's the scientific study or the interaction between nutrition and genes. So what we eat can support our genetic predisposition and therefore it's our uniqueness. Um, we are all different um, and uh, we should celebrate that we're all different and therefore our eating plans or at least your eating plans do need to be individual. And in my opinion, um, you know, years and years ago, it was just, oh, everybody just needs to eat this amount of carbs, this amount of protein and this amount of fats. Well, 
I don't know about that, guys. Well, I think you need to start to get to know the biochemical pathways and then we can really have an individual uh, plan for each athlete, which, you know, let's put it this way. If you've got this uniqueness, then that's probably what's really needed. So let's start at the very beginning. Um, DNA is, de is decoded by a method called transcription and a nucleotide sequence is converted from DNA into RNA. So you can see this infographic, which I've actually made up myself. Um, it's, not, it's not from anywhere. And it's RNA is translated into protein using amino acids, and they're all joined together in a long sentence, which determines the property, the function, and basically the shape of the resulting uh, protein. So your take home message here is that our proteins um, have different functions. They could be a transporter, could be messenger, could be structural, could be enzymatic reactions. Um, and I'll just give you a very quick example. Uh, vitamin C is a great antioxidant. It's regulated by a particular transporter. And what happens if this transport is, transport is not as efficient, then basically the ability for vitamin C to get into the cell may not be the best antioxidant for you. All right. So really what we're looking at is the is the actual uh, protein production, uh, which is what I'm really, really interested in. So on this next infographic, you'll notice here is that um, the changes in your instruction booklet. So obviously your RNA into a protein itself. It, it has certain enzymes or, or protein function and, and they are, can be affected. So on the left hand side here, you've got certain bases and you can see at the bottom there, you've got the description of the bases themselves. And the combination of AUA will make the amino acid isoleucine. Now, if there is a change in one of those bases, and you can see it's the bottom one that's actually changed from an A to a G, that will actually uh, make methionine. Now, in this particular circumstances, there is a possibility that that won't make any difference whatsoever, depending on what it is. But for some people, certain changes, which are known as a single nucleotide polymorphisms, could have an issue. And it's this that I'm really, really interested in. Because if our genes or our, our predisposition to certain uh, genes, if they're efficient or inefficient, I really want to know that because then we can really tailor a plan specifically for athletes. Okay, now, traditionally on the left-hand side, you'll see here, this is this little infographic that I made up. Athletes have been out buying the best kits that you can get. So it's the best shirts and, you know, the best sort of um, kit that's going to make you more aerodynamic. All right. So or there might be purchasing certain equipment that's got the latest tires or the, the new design of spikes, for instance. All right. So you're going to be doing that to give you the best edge to achieve a better time. And of course, obviously, coaches and nutritionists and sports dietitians have long been advising specific amounts, carbohydrates, fats and proteins in relation to the amount of exercise or competing you're actually doing. Now, all of this has been really successful over the years. But when we look at nutrition, it's more than just a two dimensional thing. Um, and, and for me, that has its limitations. So, and that's because individuals respond differently to different foods. So the careful calculation of macronutrients versus the amount of exercise is justified. And I'm not taking saying that that's not the right thing to do. However, genetic differences have been found that are going to affect an individual's absorption, their metabolism, their utilization, and the breakdown of nutrients. So what I mean by nutrients, I mean the micro uh, nutrients. So that's um, the, the, the building blocks in our biological pathways. So I don't understand why you guys can invest in all this technology, um, everything in the kit and the equipment and everything that you have, 
without actually looking at the micronutrients that are affected by your genes. Because to me, this would make the full, the complete thing. So you've got your kits, you've got your equip, uh, equipment, you're looking at your protein, carbs and fats. Well, what's, what's left? Well, let's look at the micronutrients. And of course, some of those um, uh, you know, are actually affected by your genes. So nutrigenomic examines your genetic results and the effects on the nutrients supplying your body with the substrates that's needed to perform. Okay, So this branch of genetic study um, doesn't incur whether you're going to be any better than the next person. It's going to highlight to you your uniqueness and what to eat to optimize your energy production. All right, so all your repair potential or potentially, you know, sleep and lifestyle choices that you may or may not have had. So this is my, um, my sort of um, idea of the beginning of energy production. So within the matrix of the mitochondria, there is a series of chemical reactions that occur and they result in the production of energy. And this biochemical pathway is called the citric acid cycle or the Krebs cycle. And it uses the nutrients to produce an energy carrying molecule. And that's called adenosine triphosphate or ATP as we know it. And this is needed for your muscles, your muscles to contract, immune health and your energy production. So we don't store ATP molecules per se. It's the role of the carbohydrates, the proteins and the fats to provide the glucose, the fatty acids and the amino acids, which in turn is converted into acetyl-CoA. And it's this process that um, is needed as the cofactors. And interestingly, a lot of cofactors can be derived from vitamins and minerals. Now, unfortunately, these vital nutrients are actually in short supply and the body will prioritize the supply of most of this to, the, to organs, so such as your brain and your, and as your heart. And it will actually sacrifice other organs and systems that are pivotal to an athlete. So we, of course, this is why we, we've been taking, you know, much um, attention to all of the proteins, fats and carbs that we've actually been taking in. But what we haven't been looking at is the little guys, and that is your micronutrients. So again, this is, this is my um, sort of interpretation of the Krebs cycle. Now, the Krebs cycle is in much, much more detail than this. It is a really complicated sort of uh, process. And anybody that's tried to study the Krebs cycle in detail, uh, I don't know about you, but it's given me quite a few headaches over the years, let's put it that way. Anyway, so once we actually make acetyl-CoA, um, we have the following reactions that occur. And they are, it's, it's almost like a circle of different reactions, but the compounds or the, the vitamins and minerals that you can see in the yellow boxes, they are all of the cofactors that are needed for energy cycle to produce your ATP molecules. So today we're going to have a look at the first substrate. So you can see that that's cysteine, glutathione and iron and those gene interactions and their potential issues that could be involved. But most of all, what can we actually do about it? Because it's all very well learning about this, but you need to have some take home messages as to what can you do about it? So let's let's have a look at the very first one. So, um, you know, cysteine is an amino acid uh, which we can produce ourselves and therefore it's not one of the 12 essential amino acids. Now, in my opinion, this does not make it any less important, all right? So cysteine often participates in all sorts of enzymatic reactions that can be susceptible to oxidation. So they're found in certain foods such as chicken and turkey, yogurt, uh, eggs, for instance, but to a much lesser extent of sunflower seeds and legumes. So humans can synthesize cysteine as long as there is a sufficient quantity of another amino acid, and that is called methionine, all right? So now why do we need cysteine? Well, cysteine is a precursor for methionine production, 
and that's used in a biochemical process called methylation. And it's really important uh, for many reasons. But of course, it's also the precursor of glutathione production, which is the next thing that we're going to talk about in a bit in a, in a while. OK, so that second metabolite is also used in the Krebs cycle. So that's glutathione. So now cysteine itself does have a few genes regulating it. All right. But a change in the base or a snip in that would mean you would have a life limiting disease and basically you would not be able to be uh, an athlete. OK, so to actually include those types of genes would be you know, unethical. So I don't include any cysteine genes, but I do include um, methionine genes, for instance. All right. So. What we're really looking at here is I'm not asking you to change the amount of protein you're actually eating. All right. What I would like you guys to do, your take home message is ensure you're eating cysteine rich protein. So look at the profile of the protein that you're eating, particularly if you're getting your cysteine from vegetable sources okay because in this instance um they're far less in sunflower and legumes than there is in uh, turkey and chicken for instance okay so you guys really need to to pay attention now the precursor to uh, methionine as i said is cysteine and they're both really important amino acids um that we eat and we also produce all right so Methionine is really mainly available in meats, in dairy and eggs, and the highest levels of methionine in veggie sources is actually seaweed, pumpkin seeds and turnips. I'd like to see somebody's plate that's got those three on it. OK, so if somebody sends me a picture, there might be a prize involved on that one. Um, now, methionine does feature in beans and lentils, but at really low levels. All right. So unlike cysteine, there are many key genes that regulate methionine production. And the point of methylation is to produce something that's known as a methyl donor. And basically all you do is you add that to a substance to make it more biologically active. Now, I'm not going to go through the whole of methylation here at all. That's not the point of today. But there are some key things that you might want to think about. Now, you can see on the slide, there's some cofactors that you need. All right. So these are predominantly B vitamins. And if you're eating lots of veggies, you'll be supplying all the B bits that you need. All right. One area you need to think about is choline and betaine. Now, choline is mainly in eggs and meats. So in vegetables, for instance, you'd have to eat a whole head of broccoli, and that contains about 36 milligrams of choline. Um, an egg actually has 340 milligrams. So you can see there's this real disparity between the two. Now, betaine is mainly found in beetroots, and I know there's probably quite a few out there that are having your beetroot shots, for instance, uh, for your nitric oxide, which is your vasodilator. But guess what, guys, there's a key gene for that one. So, um, you know, if, if you want to find that out as to whether that's actually going to be a benefit, then obviously uh, you need to have a look at that as well. Anyway, so cysteine and methionine. Cysteine is a precursor to methionine. Very, very important an amino acid. So no key genes for cysteine, but there are some key genes for um, methionine. Now, um, you'll see here, these are the key genes that are either directly or indirectly involved in methionine production. So if any one of these SNPs um, has a change in the base, then there is a function that has been reduced. So in other words, it's not going to be as efficient as perhaps you would like it to be. Now, obviously, my take home message, first of all, would be let's get your genes tested and find out what's actually going on there. But another vital um, metabolite in this is actually homocysteine and homocysteine levels. So if you want to find out for your cysteine and methionine, you need to have a look at homocysteine levels and ensure you've got enough 
to supply the production of methionine because basically methionine is pretty much uh, methylated homocysteine that's all it is um, you know so so that's pretty much where where that's actually going if you've got high homocysteine levels this could be because of your genetic predisposition predisposition all right so these SNPs or these particular genes that you've got on this particular slide here um, you want to check those because they will regulate b12 and folate levels which are really really important as well particularly in in the recycling of homocysteine as well which is going to have an effect on methionine levels all right so um, those are sort of things that you need to think about again you also need to have a look at choline levels particularly if you're a veggie or a vegan um, and you also might want to have a look at uh, zinc, which is a cofactor in all of this as well. So whilst, um, you know, cysteine itself doesn't actually have any genes that are, um, you know, directly linked to it for an athlete, when obviously there are genes, but you wouldn't be an athlete if, if you had SNPs in those, um, you've got to think about the actual biochemical pathway of cysteine. So cysteine is a precursor for methionine, and these are the key genes you need to think about. And of course, they regulate B9, B12, choline, and betaine. So again, these are all easy things that you guys can do to make sure that you actually eat these or drink them, depending on, on what it is, um, you know, for, on these protein powders and things that you guys are obviously, um, you know, um, quite good at having. So let's have a look at glutathione. Um, now, glutathione is our master antioxidant. Now, the role of glutathione um, is, is obviously that one of the, the, the key things in energy production um, and it's got two very important roles. So it's comprised of amino acids. So cysteine, again, we've, we've spoken about cysteine before, glycine and glutamic acid make up glutathione. But glutathione is not actually considered essential and therefore the body's got mechanisms to produce these amino acids. So the cysteine, glycine and glutamic acid. Now, in times of oxidative stress or increased exercise or increased inflammation, these amino acids are considered conditionally essential. So and that's because of the demands on the body. Uh, particularly to repair um, and the, the parts that glutathione uh, really plays in detoxifying certain toxic metabolites, uh, which are produced under stress. Okay, so um, you can see the foods um, that are on this particular slide, the food sources. Now, there's not that many foods that put glutathione in them. Um, so you would actually need to eat cysteine, glycine and glutamic acid, which are in mainly allium foods and the sulforane foods, which you've got a list of list of here. Absolutely. So it's very well documented that athletes produce far more reactive oxygen species and, and they are and you guys are susceptible to inflammation. So for me, glutathione would be an area that I would definitely have a look at, not just from a genetic perspective, but just obviously in the fact that what you're actually doing um, is going to be creating that inflammation, the reactive, uh, reactive oxygen species. So I've just picked out one particular, um, uh, you know, um, uh, research paper um, and it pretty much you know pretty much says that an increased risk in exercise intensity is one of the main ways in which oxidative stress and free radical production has been shown to increase inside your cells so you know effective regulation of cellular balance between the oxidation and antioxidation is important when you're looking at cellular function. And so therefore, this is where we're gonna to start to get really quite important for, you know, um, for energy production, all right? So we know that glutathione is an antioxidant 
and it's involved in many processes in the body, um, tissue building, repair, and again, energy production, all right? There's lots of research papers out there that correlate between glutathione and oxidative stress. I've had a look and unfortunately quite a few of them are really concentrating on glutathione as a supplement as such. Um, I, I'm not a fan of putting in, um, you know, what I call end products, um, but um, yeah, we, we might want to think about um, uh, glutathione for instance. Now this is my interpretation of uh, glutathione production, all right? So um, you'll notice here um, the mechanism of how it can be generated by the body. So we convert a homocysteine into cystathione and then into cysteine and onto glutathione. And you can see that via the diagram that we've actually got there, okay? Um, and then basically, now, first of all, you can test your homocysteine levels, first of all, really, really easily. Um, you can go to most labs uh, these days um, and you can get that done really easily. All right. Now, we want to test homocysteine levels um, purely and simply because if levels are high or excessively low, um, then, you know, we would be wondering why that might be the case. What's actually impacting that? What's impacting homocysteine? Um, and is it to do with the genetic point of view? Is it because homocysteine is unable to convert into cystothione and then cysteine and then into glutathione efficiently because of the GSS gene? You can see um, on the slide here. Now, what might also be happening is if you do have a SNP on the GSS gene, what could actually be happening is the homocysteine goes into cystothione, but then we can also make some uh, quite uh, serious amounts of ammonia. Now, when you are actually doing your, um, you know, your, your athletic training or if you're doing, um, you know, a run or, or a competition, um, you know, there is a good chance that you're going to be producing excess ammonia as well. So you need your glutathione in order to be able to mop up that excess ammonia. Now, interestingly, um, if you've got any form of sort of gut dysbiosis, ammonia is a byproduct of that as well. All right, so we need to, in my opinion, look after glutathione production, uh, particularly for you guys. Now, like I say, glutathione as a supplement is actually very poorly absorbed. OK, so there's loads of research out there saying that, you know, um, if you take glutathione supplementation, it's going to help with your exercise. It's going to, you know, decrease the amount of muscle fatigue. Um, like I say, I'm not a fan of putting the end product, uh, product in. Have a look at the foods that will make up the uh, amino acids for glutathione production. I would always go there first. Um, and glutathione itself um, is actually quite poorly absorbed unless it's in a liposomal form. Um, and that's because the stomach acid basically um, is just going to uh, render the glutathione um, inactive. Um, you can get glutathione in liposomal form, um, but of course you have to have be very careful if you're subjected to, um, you know, um, testing. Um, you know, obviously you can't can't do any of that. I don't believe any of the glutathiones have actually been um, agreed by any of the bodies. So, um, you know, just be very very careful of that. Um, but yeah, personally, if you're going to do glutathione, it'll have to be in a liposomal form. Now it doesn't stop there with regards to glutathione because glutathione for me is a is a magic um, is a magic metabolite basically. So again, this is my interpretation of the what's known as an antioxidant cascade, and this to me highlights the importance of glutathione. But but you know pretty much all of the antioxidants. So the diagram um, on the bottom right here is demonstrating um, the different states a molecule can be in. 
um, and you'll notice that there's a red one that's got a you know a bit of an angry angry he's the free radical or she's the free radical I'm trying not to be sexist here so that is a free radical um, and we have an antioxidant on the right hand side there that is very happily and very kindly going to donate what's known as an electron and basically in this donation the free radical is oxidized and in the donation it becomes reduced or it's what's called as reduced so it's it then becomes this stable molecule but in the process of doing that the vitamin c molecule then becomes a free radical so on the actual infographic you'll see on the top left it says i've just used red as the color I, I'm, I'm very colorful I, I learn in color so free radical is on the left hand side now it seems that vitamin e is very happy to come along and um, render the free radical um, um, uh, reduced and so in other words it, it donates its electron to the free radical so it becomes this stable molecule the trouble is that then means that vitamin e is then a free radical so vitamin c comes along and says oh hang on a minute i need to go and donate my electron to vitamin e because they are an oxidant they are free radical so vitamin c comes along he does that that's fine but in doing that the vitamin c then becomes a free radical so it's this chain effect that actually happens and this is where the super glutathione in my opinion comes along because glutathione can actually what they call reduce itself it doesn't need to have anything donated to it it's a glutathione disulfide reductase it's an enzyme that it uses to actually reduce itself so effectively um, it, it not only helps with the antioxidant status but it also is almost like the end stop of the antioxidant cascade so um so for me glutathione is really really important particularly for you guys when you are going out doing what you're doing you're producing free radicals you need to look after glutathione because this is the one that's going to be able to save the day effectively in my opinion so there's actually two, um, two uh, sort of key genes, which we'll come on to, um, but there is an awful lot of research that's concentrating on the supplementation of glutathione, as I've said before. What I'm trying to say to you guys is, please have a look at the food, first of all, and then have a look at your genes, and then do we need to do something about it, all right? So, you know, this is the sort of thing that I, I'm really much more passionate about. So, like I say, there's two actual genes um, that, um, well, there's more than two genes, but the main ones that were, that, uh, that we look at is GSS, which is known as the glutathione synthase, and the GST. M1, there's a T1 and a P1, uh, but the M1 is, is the main one. Um, so from a genetic point of view, there are two avenues to consider regarding glutathione. So the final step in glutathione production and the ability to detoxify excess free radicals being produced. All right. So the first one, GSS, is all to do with the final step of glutathione synthesis. And that uh, particular gene um, is, is basically the enzyme that's involved in the series of chemical reactions that take place in the majority of the body cells. So in other words, it's that final step um, before glutathione is produced. And if you've got a SNP there, then that production of glutathione isn't going to be as efficient as we would like it to be. All right. So what can we do about this? Your, you know, your your take home message here is have a look at other antioxidants. Of course, vitamin E and vitamin C are the two most people will think about. But please also think about selenium. It's an amazing antioxidant. Um, and uh, you can see the, the uh, selenium rich foods um, at the bottom of that particular slide there. Now, there is the family of genes called glutathione S transferase or GSTs for short. Um, and these can actually be upregulated in times of stress. However, some people uh, can be predisposed to reduce production. So in other words, it's not going to be as efficient as we would like it to be. 
And uh, for some, they actually have an absence or it's, it's known as a null. So in other words, the ability uh, for glutathione uh, production isn't anywhere near as efficient as, as other people. So for me, this is why it's really important to know your genetic status uh, re regarding not only obviously this particular one, but, but in, in total. And the reason I, I, I've highlighted this one is because a lot of you are cycling on roads. A lot of you are you know, in touch with a lot of pollution. You know, there's a lot of cars and all that sort of stuff, okay? Um, and therefore, GST is actually involved in the detoxification of certain metabolites, um, particularly environmental carcinogens. All right. So, you know, if you've got a null um, uh, gene here or the GSTM1 isn't as efficient. Now, I'm not saying that you can't go out and do all your cycle rides. I'm not saying any of that. But we're going to need to support you um, in the ability to detoxify these pollutants that you're going to be exposed to. All right. So for me, um, I would look at selenium or selenium, depending on where you are in this world, um, and particular um, because it would be definitely a great one for oxidative stress and, and obviously just the antioxidants in general. Um, but it is also a cofactor for glutathione as well. So your take home messages or your take home message really is check your genetic status, have a look at homocysteine, um, ensure all of your cofactors are being eaten and your cofactors are B9, B12, choline, betaine, um, and all of those things that you need and the amino acids that we've got on these slides. And of course, you guys will get a copy of the slides as well. Um, make sure you're eating lots of antioxidants. So antioxidants tend to be in brightly colored foods. So if your plate is looking pretty bland, then potentially you're not really um, maximizing on your antioxidant intake. Now, you might want to think about supplementation of glutathione, but be careful of that, obviously. Um, but also be careful if you are being, um, you know, uh, monitored at all. And therefore, um, you know, please don't take glutathione if it's not on your list and you're able to do that. Always start with the food, in my opinion. OK, so let's have a look at um, iron or FE is known as iron. Um, and so iron um, is a mineral uh, that the body needs for growth and development. So your body uses iron to make uh, hemoglobin, uh, which is a protein in red blood cells. Um, and that carries oxygen from the lungs to all parts of the body. Um, it's also uh, something called a myoglobin and a protein that provides oxygen to muscles. So obviously iron is really important. Um, I'm not an advocate, um, particularly if you test iron levels and it's low. I'm not an advocate just to chuck loads more of iron into, uh, into an athlete um, because you need to maximize the ability of absorption for iron in my opinion um so yeah so now reduced levels of iron are actually associated with anemia um and there is another anemia called megaloblastic anemia and this is caused by low levels of b12 or b9 all right now both conditions are found to be very common in athletes um and basically the result of which can really have a negative effect on your performance. Now, you know, symptoms are quite easy to, uh, to get. So in athletes um, includes fatigue, general weakness, and in some cases, shortness of breath. Now, if you've been doing a lot of, um, you know, exercise, you've been perhaps, I don't know, training for some sort of um, extended race or something like that, then, you know, potentially fatigue and general weaknesses are just going to be your, your symptoms. You might not know anything about your iron levels. All right. So just be careful with those. Um, it's iron is really important for anybody exercising because it supports 
um, or acts as a cofactor in the energy production. So it also helps with cognitive perform performance, which I know athletes are actually really good. They've got really good uh, cognitive performance, particularly eye, um, you know, um, ability to, to obviously see where they're going. Um, and um, you, you guys tend to have very good eye perception um, anyway. All right. Now, when you're doing um, or elite athletes have a much higher demand for iron, and that's because of the intensity of the exercise. Now, females are at a particular risk of low iron levels due to menstruation, um, and they also have a lower total nutrient intake anyway. So they may be getting lower levels compared to males anyway. So um, if any of you are doing high altitude training, um, inflammation and environmental factors can influence the status of iron levels and that's in both sexes all right so it's very very important this mineral but it's also really important to get it right in my opinion and because we need it um, in the right levels if you have too much iron it becomes an oxidant and of course then we don't want to add to the oxidative stress that you are potentially um, producing whilst you're doing all of your wonderful exercise and or competing, for instance. OK, so those are sort of things you might want to think about. Now, obviously, iron is really, really easy to test. I'm, I'm sure you guys um, probably do that um, quite often. Um, but just make sure you have a look at the iron and the ferritin. So the actual stores itself. OK. Because uh, you could be putting in iron um, and actually you've got loads of stores of it, but actually your blood levels might be quite low. So there's lots of different ratios you might want to have a look at for iron. Now, you can see this great big list of different types of uh, things that iron has to navigate in order for absorption to happen. All right. So. Um, I'm an advocate for putting the right foods in and iron um, rich foods are definitely one of them in this particular instance. But iron's got an awful lot of enemies almost. Um, phytates in cereals and legumes and polyphenols in coffee and cocoa. Yeah. Or, you know, your black tea, for instance. And there's polyphenols in chamomile tea, for instance. You know, you're most people, you know, uh, athletes would want a, a decent uh, camera tea. Well, you have to be careful, guys. It's got the polyphenols in it. Um, who's eating their spinach raw? Great. Wonderful. It's got the oxalates. It's going to stop the iron absorption, basically. All right. So these are the sorts of things that you might want to start to think about. Um, proteins, um, particularly milk and egg, um, have a potential almost interference with the ability for iron to be absorbed. Um, and you have something that's called a divalent uh, mineral. So in other words, it's going to actually block the absorption. So this is why um, in medication, for instance, calcium is told to be taken away from iron because it can have this uh, divalent effect. So in other words, it stops it from being absorbed. Um, there's certain um, nutrient deficiencies um, that, um, which are vitamin A, for instance, vitamin C and B2. Now, if you're eating all your green veggies and you're getting all of that in, you should have a problem. Vitamin A might be a problem for veggie and vegans. And the reason being is there is a key gene here that looks at, well, it, it pretty much controls the the, the ability for beta carotene to be converted into retinol. Um, now, if you have preformed vitamin A, that doesn't seem to be um, affected at all, really. So if you are looking at just your vitamin A levels and you're looking at, um, uh, you're just eating vegetarian or vegan, that's fine. 
but just be careful. Again, you might want to have a look at your genetics to see if you've got a SNP on that particular gene and therefore we need to support that. It doesn't mean you can't be a vegetarian or vegan. It means you need to, you're highlighting something that needs to be supporting, all right? So, you know, that's the sort of thing that um, nutrigenomics can actually um, really um, help you with. Acute and chronic inflammation can actually uh, it disrupt the absorption of iron. And also, um, if you have a fast transit time, then obviously the iron isn't able to, to do what it needs to do. All right. Now, one thing that is definitely been researched and most definitely something that you can do that's really easy, and that is eat your vitamin C rich foods with your iron rich foods. All right. So, if you're going to have any of your iron rich foods, which is obviously on the slide before, make sure you're going to be eating some rich, uh, vitamin C rich foods. So that's all, you've, all of your brightly coloured uh, vegetables and fruits, for instance. OK, so don't be shy of eating two types of, um, you know, uh, vitamins together because they do act as cofactors, for instance. Now, here we're going to go with the uh, with the actual, um, you know, sort of um, iron absorption is actually quite, well, it's not really very simple, to be honest with you. There, there's several things that need to happen for the body to take iron up efficiently. All right. So iron needs to be converted. So dietary iron needs to be reduced from, it's known as an FE3 form into an FE2 form. All right. So you don't need to know the actual forms. But that reduction occurs um, via certain enzymes that are in your gut, okay? And those enzymes need to be present and active in order for that reduction to occur, all right? So first of all, not only do we need to have a look at vitamin C rich foods, we need to have a look at gut health as well, all right? So, you know, if you've got um, digestive issues, then potentially iron absorption is going to be a problem. And if you've got low iron levels, then one of the easy things you, you would know yourself is to actually look at gut health, all right? And if, you, if you're an athlete and you need some help, go and find a sports nutritionist or a nutritionist that can help you with that, because that's only going to help you in all of your vitamins and minerals, all right? So the, when the iron enters um, what's known as an enterocyte, um, where it's held, there are signals from the bloodstream that encourage the transport of iron from inside those enterocytes into the bloodstream. And that's via something that's called a ferroportin, which you've got all the information here on the slide, all right? Now, ferroportin is regulated by the hormone hepcidin, okay? So that's actually quite important in relation to the genetics behind them. Now, this is why just chucking in more iron is not the answer, in my opinion, all right? So you need to understand how you can support iron the uptake or absorption is it because you're eating the wrong foods with the iron rich foods first of all that's a really easy thing to look at is it because um you know you've got digestive issues do you just need to get those sorted out and you're going to absorb more iron and therefore all of the other vitamins and minerals more efficiently all right so these are the sorts of things you might might want to start to think about okay now, there are some key genes that I test for here, all right? And um, so, so iron is, is regulated by these three key genes, and the role is to regulate um, a peptide hormone called hepcidin, and that binds to the iron and stops it from being available, all right? So um, we don't need all the iron that we absorb sometimes, on other times, we need all of the iron that we're going to be absorbing, all right? So um, basically, this, this peptide hormone, hepcidin, which binds to the iron and stops it from being available, that then stops it from, from developing the red blood cells, which obviously transports the oxygen to the body's tissues. Um, and hepcidin very happily binds to iron when inflammation is generated, 
So of course you guys are, you know, are in the camp where you're going to be producing more inflammation because of just, just by the sheer fact of what you're actually doing. All right, now the first gene, the TMPRSS6, which is a really catchy name for a gene, it's involved in the regulation of hepcidin itself. All right, so, um, you know, it will actually have a look and it will, it's all about the utilization and the uptake of the iron from the diet. All right, so um, now again, if you've got low levels of iron rich foods um, or they're not optimal, this could result in a lower blood levels of iron. But of course, if you've got a snip on this one, that's also just going to exacerbate the problem. All right. Now, the TFR2 gene has actually got two functions. Uh, first of all, it plays an essential role in hepcidin regulation. Um, and it's said that it also has a what we call a receptor function. Um, where it makes a protein called transferrin receptor 2. Don't need to worry about that. But basically, this receptor function supports the transfer of iron into the liver cells, where it's actually going to be uh, transported into the blood and therefore into the tissues and therefore obviously carrying the oxygen for your aerobic um, exercises. All right. So if you've got a, a snip on your TFR2, it's not as efficient as we would want it to be. And then we've got the last one, which is known as TF, um, and this is uh, involved in the transporting of iron uh, for use or it's going to be stored. So if this gene isn't as efficient as it should be, then there is a potential of an increased risk of low iron status. So your take home message for all of this really is for your iron section is obviously check your iron genes. Iron rich foods with vitamin C foods, absolute must. Support your uh, B9 and B12 because of the risk of megaloblastic anemia and get help if you've got digestive issues, okay? Now, I know that some athletes have their blood taken much off, much more often than four times a year. Um, you know, elite athletes will have their blood taken after each uh, race or after each um, event, for instance. Um, for the guys um, that are not in that uh, level, I would go and have your iron tested a minimum of four times a year because you need to understand your level of iron. All right. Because it's going to be different for everybody else. And of course, for women, it's going to be different potentially throughout the month as well. OK, now I want to just throw in another sort of um, curveball is consider a probiotic, which is going to enhance the absorption. Now, you, the, the particular probiotic um, strain itself, which has been scientifically proven to enhance the absorption of iron is Lactobacillus plantarum 299V. All right, so that's the whole name of the lat. Now, be careful of the products that are out there because they'll just say Lactobacillus plantarum. All right, so you need to know it's the 299V strain. And it's this strain that works on the actual iron uptake mechanism and um, it helps with the the actual transferrin porting the transporter protein um, and and there's quite a lot well, there are uh, research out there which I'm more than happy to send to you all right so again of course be careful if you're going to be um, tested um, you know probiotics are not on the UK's um, elite a list that you're allowed to take if you're not an elite then obviously you might want to have a look at probiotics if you want to enhance the iron you're already eating so again i'm not talking about chucking in more iron i'm talking about actually enhancing the iron that you're actually eating all right so there's loads of things that you can do there um, with your uh, nutritionist or yourself or with your you know your pt for instance um, you know there's there's lots of information that you can that you can take from today and obviously um, increase or at least help with your um, uh, iron absorption now 
I wanted to give you a bit of a case study in regards to uh, Steve, the Iron Man. Um, I love Steve. Um, he um, he wrote me this wonderful um, little sort of ditty on on once he had his results. So basically, what he did, he he actually went and uh, and got all three of the reports. Um, and um, we we went through them together. We found his B9 and B12 genes were not as efficient as perhaps they should be. His choline gene, which is known as the PEMP gene, wasn't efficient at all. Um, and he also had transporter issues with his iron as well. So he was actually taking iron. I went, oh no, please don't. We will just try and help with the absorption um, on that. So when it does transport, it will be as efficient as we as it can be. Um, and genetically, he was predisposed to um, potentially high levels of inflammation. All right. So um, it doesn't mean that it plays out. Um, so what we did, um, well, we looked at his uh, foods are um, supplying all of those vitamins and minerals. And um, he's been eating that way now. Um, he's changed the way that he does some of his training um, to, uh, to minimize the increased inflammation that he's potentially um, at a higher risk of. And, um, you know, basically he was just trying to push harder and harder, which obviously causes all sorts of problems of fatigue and illness. Um, and he's now very happy with the times um, that he's now achieving by literally changing the foods that he's eating and modifying um, some of his training. He actually now has uh, an extra couple of rest days, um, which he was really frightened of doing, um, but he actually has a couple of extra rest days and actually that's much better for him um, and, um, and, he, and he's seeing the benefits. Um, so yeah, so um, the reports, um, energy production, so cysteine, methionine, which obviously I've just been through, um, includes CoQ10, um, and athletes are actually predisposed to iron overload as well. Um, there's, for some reason, there seems to be more, more athletes that um, have this particular tendency. Um, in the repair report, you can see there's lots of vitamins and minerals in there. Uh, nitric oxide, which a lot of um, athletes are quite interested in, um, and then sleep and lifestyle. It's about your melatonin production and your superoxide dissimutation as well um so thank you very much guys thank you very much i don't even know what time is have i gone over hopefully i haven't gone over well i probably have yes yeah, sorry about that ian um uh, but if you've got any questions um and i'm also running a bit of a promo so but you'll have that in your slides as well so over to you ian thank you karen uh, if you can just unshare There you go. Okay, thank you, Karen. We're going to pop over to a QA and a in just a sec um, to complete this evening. I just want to do this every webinar, just a couple of minutes on the course that this is all part of. Uh, so the webinar series is sponsored by the Centre for Integrative Sports and Nutrition. We have the first intake of 2021 coming um, in just under two months time at the start of June. At the moment, because of the world situation, it's uh, entirely online. Normally we have the course in London as well. And I'll just pop up um, some price options for you now. And we're running an early bird special till the, till the end of the month. Okay, so the main certificate course has three modules which is priced at £2,300. We've also added a module four, which is a cookery module, which is really nice and expansive in terms of your, uh, what you can offer clients. And we also have standalone options for module three, which is our specialist module or module four. We also do, if this is a bit expensive for you to pay in one go, we, we also do 12 month payment plans. Um, and we've got discounts for band and bases members. And uh, if you can just unmute yourself, whoever that was. 
Um, and also students, um, students get a nice discount, but we're also taking a 10% uh, discount off until the end of April. Okay, so these would be the prices. If you've been sort of thinking about the course for a while, just go onto our website and put in an expression of interest form, which asks you a few questions about yourself and we will respond straight away. Either myself or Simone will, will um, get back to you and uh, give you options. Okay, uh, here's all the details of our contacts. So, you know, jump on our website or Facebook or Twitter, we, we, we'll answer all of them. Okay, so over to you, Karen. We are going to open to questions, anything that, we, that Karen talked about today. Just shout, we've got about 28 people online, so perhaps too many to unmute in one go. So just tap in your questions. Uh, what would you like to know more of? Any particular things that Karen said that you weren't sure about and you'd just like to clarify? Um, I've got one question if, uh, if nobody jumps on quickly enough. Okay. Right. I'll ask my question. Nobody's yeah, we'll quick enough. For it. <laughs> An easy one. So uh, I thought a good one for you to clarify was the supplementation. Um, yeah. As you know, glutathione's got the reputation of not being well absorbed through the uh, gastrointestinal tract, but there's the liposomal. Um, there's also a few other um, glutathione feeding supplementation options. Uh, like NAC is mm. one, and also I've used um, broccoli, sprouted broccoli uh, extract. So I was thinking what you might, uh, what your thoughts on, of those are. Absolutely. Um, like I say, I'm not actually a fan of putting the end product in. So uh, NAC or N-acetylcysteine um, would definitely be something that I would have a look at. Um, you can buy that in a supplemental form. Um, I think I saw it in a powder uh, before. Um, I, I'm sort of going away from the, the actual capsules and going more for powders and liquids and liposomal um, personally, um, so that then, you know, there's less for the body to do and potentially more absorbability, uh, particularly if you've got um, gut issues, which I know that a lot of athletes, um, you know, um, do uh, for whatever reason. Um, and uh, yes, NAC, I have no problem with that whatsoever. Um, of course, there are certain guidelines how much you should take, um, but you can obviously, um, you know, have a look at how much uh, you're supposed to take and then do a bit of a trial on, on how well it helps or may not help you. You, you know, with, with all of this, we're all individuals. So, I mean, I can take NAC, I find no difference whatsoever absolutely none but I can take glutathione liposomally and I will see a difference so again we're all unique so we just have to experiment um, with those and uh, see how you go uh, but yes NAC definitely for sure and if it's in a powder or in a protein powder then go for it absolutely um, and what were your thoughts about the broccoli sprouts Oh, yes. Broccoli sprouts. I mean, you know, what a great pastime uh, to sprout your own yourself. I mean, you know, what a great um, sort of present uh, for people at, um, you know, Christmas or birthdays is to get them a sprouter. You know, um, if you sprout anything, um, you're going to have more protein. Um, you know, protein levels are going to go up. Therefore, your amino acid profile is going to go up. Um, and therefore, yeah, definitely. Absolutely. Um, I haven't done it yet, but I'm, there's one, one athlete that's in mind that sometimes just won't, won't have a rest day. And I might actually get them to start sprouting them, you know, their own, own stuff. So they'll stay still for 10 minutes. <laughs> Um, but yeah, for sure. Absolutely. And you don't need a, an expensive kit. You know, you can just use the jam jars and there's plenty of information online these days. Yeah, I mean, sprouting, a lot of athletes are so time poor 
um, because they train so much. Um, so trying to get them cooking properly from the, for themselves is a challenge. So sprouting is so easy to do that it's actually a little introduction into growth and um, self-nourishment. So I think it's a good one. Absolutely. Um, okay, other questions, guys, before we round off for today? Vegans in terms of getting enough choline. Well, yeah, there is that, isn't there? Um, hmm. um, you can have a look at, um, well, of course, I mean, you're going to be eating far more vegetables. So, of course, your, your milligrams of choline are going to go up. You could look at um, vegan sources of phosphatase tidal choline which would probably be soy um there is that option but of course you know just have to be careful with soy itself um but other than that there isn't that much so for me personally for for vegan athletes it, there's to coin the term of uh, uh what's his name paul saladino there's the three c's there's choline, carnitine, and creatine. They're the three things that you'd have to be very careful that you're going to be getting in good amounts um, for an athlete um, to be, if you are a, a, a vegan, um, because you'll be using up all of those pools of different nutrients out quite quickly. Um, so yeah. Mm. There may be an algae that's out there that's probably got some choline in it that you could could have a look at, um, but I would say probably soya, unfortunately. Uh, that would be one way of doing it. Uh, and then Debbie asked about the sprouted broccoli compared to sprouted, a thin yeah. supplement. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> how much dare do you put on? Well, look, do you know what? Um, yeah be careful with the sulfur and aim uh, supplement um because uh, obviously it's sulfur containing that can produce um you know um other um um has has digestive issues um just be careful with that um well look do you know what have spread spread broccoli at least once or twice on your salads each day or you can whiz them up and put them in your smoothie for instance if you are doing that um so there's always ways of getting sprouted anything um on top uh, the one thing i did do the other day was i made a soup and i i didn't want to eat them separately so i just shoved them all in whizzed up the soup and actually had them all together in the soup um, and that worked perfectly fine so, yeah for those who need to supplement there are certain product companies that do a sprouted broccoli in a capsule. Now, there was one called Cell Assure that I accessed in South Africa. I haven't come across it here in the UK yet. Mm. And that, that's potentially because of the cross, depends on what you're sprouting, depends on uh, whether, if it's, you know, like sprouted broccoli, then you're gonna have the dim aspect, which you can't have here. Um, in the UK, you have to be very careful with that. Um, but yeah, just sprout away, you'll be fine. It's good advice. I love it when there's a nice scientific presentation with lots of biochemistry and we finish with real food. <laughs> That's wonderful. No, for sure. Um, but yeah, wonderful. Thanks, Karen. No worries. I really appreciate your, your presentation and your input. And Karen, Karen's going to be presenting for the first time for us this year on the CISN course. Um, so she's going to team teach with me on the individualization and nutrigenomic uh, section. So we're looking forward to that. Thank, so you much. Thank you for that. So thanks everyone for joining us and sticking with us. Um, Sorry, that's it's always fun. a good sign how many people hang on, how good the presentation is. So join us again, first Wednesday of every month. So next month, I believe it's um, my partner, Rachel Jessen doing a talk on sports cookery, which is uh, taking this aspect and uh, stretching it out a bit. Well, okay, she'll be so, 
She might be sprouting, but she might go a little bit more advanced than that. Fabulous. So, keep well, everyone, and uh, thanks for joining. Thank you, everybody.